Hi, my name is Ole Henrik Andestal. I am project manager of Green Car, and today I am going to try to explain why thousands of Norwegians are buying electric vehicles. Um, I had the pleasure of being invited to give this speech by uh, Matthew Klippenstein. Um, I was aiming to do it live, but unfortunately, your time zone is slightly different from the one I am currently in. So I hope you will be satisfied with this recording. Uh, if you should have any questions after this uh, presentation, please feel free to mail me at ohh at gronnbil dot no. Uh, the mail address is also on the last slide in the set. So, back to the question at hand, why are actually thousands of Norwegians buying electric vehicles? Is this something that can or will happen in other markets as well? First of all, um, what is Green Car? Um, we are a project. Uh, we are owned by the energy businesses in Norway, which is then essentially uh, the association for all the energy producers, energy uh, marketers, distribution companies, etc. in Norway. We are financed by the state through something called Transnova, and our target is to get 200,000 Norwegians to buy a car with a plug prior to the year 2020. Uh, to put that into perspective, there are roughly 2.3 million passenger cars in Norway. Uh, so this would then uh, be the equivalent of 7 to 8% of the total car fleet. Currently, uh, last April or this April in 2014, we passed 1% electric vehicles on the road. So we are well underway to get there, which is good. What what do we do to um, achieve this goal? Well, we work with car manufacturers, car importers, to make sure that we actually get 200,000 cars and that these prioritize the relatively insignificant market that is Norway. We work with uh, potential fleet owners, buyers, uh, potential customers to make sure that 200,000 people actually go and buy these cars because effectively that's what it boils down to. And we work with infrastructure. Someone has to build something which makes it possible to use these cars in a sensible way. At the moment, we are not quite sure what that is, but we are working on business models and usage data to try to figure it out. We are also uh, somewhat involved with framework conditions. We are not a political lobby organization, but we can suggest improvements and measures. So, slight gray area there. Um, from a Norwegian perspective, it is quite important to understand that if we are supposed to get somewhere in the future, we have to learn from the past. And from our perspective, uh, EVs are, as most of you would probably know, the oldest and most oversold technology in the industry, uh, that is the car industry. Uh, in the picture, you will find Mr. Thomas Edison sitting in the actual car, where as the guy with the cowboy hat and the revolver, might be recognized as Henry Ford. Uh, this was in the, this is around, I think, 1923. And the situation is well illustrated by the fact that Mr. Edison is in the car, because the first cars were electric, as you probably know. Um, however, by 1923, the guy with the revolver had sort of gotten the edge. So. Whereas infrastructure was actually the one of the main pluses for electric cars in the very beginning. You had DC power in your outlets and you could basically directly charge your batteries without any problems. Petrol was something that you could buy uh, in one liter glass flasks at the pharmacy. However, this changed, and the EV sort of lost out in the first battle for the car. Uh, there has been various attempts to resurrect the electric vehicle. Um, I'm sure you can find articles like this in Canadian newspapers. Uh, this one is from 1969 from a major Norwegian newspaper, and it basically says that it will be at least 10 years before EVs are commonplace in traffic. It goes on to sort of summarize what's been the status quo for electric vehicles since then. Uh, it says that the large OEMs are right around the corner with uh, a number of electric vehicles. Uh, the environment was the driver, but they didn't really care about saving the planet back in 1969. It was more about local pollution, uh, noise, those kinds of things. 
the battery is the problem, but some battery expert says that within a couple of months that will be fixed. Uh, the cars are fairly expensive to buy, but very cheap to operate. And then there is a skeptic somewhere in there saying that uh, the steam-powered car probably has a higher success rate or success chance than the electric vehicle. And today this will be hydrogen or biofuels or something else. But conceptually then, we are still in 1969. So how is it that we are going to succeed with something in 2014 that didn't work in 1969 or even 1914? Well, from our perspective, what we need to do then is to do a crash course in global macroeconomics. The Chinese have figured out that if 1.3 billion Chinese start driving cars the way we do in the West, you will have two quite significant problems. Firstly, Beijing will become an even more unpleasant place to be than it already is. Secondly, uh, there is no oil in East Asia, which means the Chinese will make themselves even more dependent on oil imports. This is not desirable from a political or an economical trade balance point of view. There are 4 billion people in Asia, out of a total of 7 billion on the planet. If Asia is supposed to start driving cars, you quite simply cannot do that with today's existing technology. That doesn't work. This is apparent to the car industry, which is seeing an increasing sales volume in the eastern markets. There are realizing that these are going to be their main growth markets and also their main volume markets in the coming years. If you're supposed to sell cars there, you quite simply have to make a new type of car with a different drivetrain that doesn't need to consume oil to the same extent that the cars we have today do. This is important because this creates a viable business model for the OEMs and that's essentially the main change from 1914. I don't know if you can read the sort of bumper sticker which is on the Chevy Volt. Um, I think it's an American Chevy Volt. It says, not green, just hate OPEC. You probably shouldn't underestimate the value of that driver. So what we're seeing from our little corner of the world is a car industry which recognizes the need and the benefits of changing and actually targeting especially the Asian market. However, this is a sort of medium to long term case. In the short to medium term, there are lots of challenges in the car industry, everything from overcapacity to uh, sales problems in Europe due to financial, well, aftermath of financial crisis, those kinds of things. So, although we are fairly confident that this is going to happen, we are not um, entirely confident as to how quickly or when. Um, if you'd ask me, I'd say that in the future, the drivetrain of cars will be electric. I am slightly more insecure about the energy storage, perhaps batteries, perhaps fuel cells, perhaps a mix, perhaps, I don't know, something else. But I do really think that the electric drivetrain is here to stay, um, and that this time it is actually going to happen. Is it going to be an evolution or a revolution? Time will tell but I'm fairly confident that we are getting somewhere. That being said, um, we are all different and people react differently to new things. This is a photo of three little girls seeing a wedding kiss for the first time in their lives. And at least in Norway, what we've been doing to try to get the market to go is to work with the girl on the left, the one who is sort of a curious optimist. And we'll deal with the two others later. Um, luckily for us, there are quite a few of the girl on the left in Norway. Um, by March 2014, we have close to 27,000 battery electric vehicles and plug-in hybrids. The vast majority of these cars are battery electric. Uh, this is due to the incentive scheme, which I will get back to in a moment. We have a few fairly negligible number of plug-in hybrids. You'll have to excuse my English. Um, these cars are fairly expensive in Norway, so they're not really competitive yet, but battery electric vehicles are. So these numbers are probably fairly abstract, but if I tell you that uh, 
so far in 2014, battery electric vehicles have around 13% market share of all new cars sold in Norway. And that in April, we passed 1% of the total number of cars on the road being electric. This is definitely then saying that we are getting somewhere. Uh, what we are looking at in Norway is a market where the electric car is actually being recognized as a segment in itself, which is something more than a curiosity. 13% of cars is actually a fairly good business. So for dealers and for the whole ecosystem around cars, electric cars are now a commercial force to be reckoned with. It is not a pilot, it is not a demonstration, it is actually a car. What this means, I'll get back to a bit later. Uh, all of the statistics are on our webpage. The link is on the last slide. You can also find it there in English by clicking the upper right hand English flag on the front page. We're seeing some interesting developments because we've had uh, an electric car market for quite some time now. And what we're seeing is that every time we get a new model into the market, that model doesn't cannibalize sales of other electric vehicles. It adds to the total market share for electric vehicles. So what you're looking at now is the sales of electric vehicles from January 2013 through March 2014. Uh, the green base area is Nissan Leaf. The blue area is Tesla Model S. Uh, then you have the orange area being Volkswagen E-Up and a few on top of that. Um, this is interesting because uh, up until now, the cars that we've had haven't really been direct competitors. Other than the fact that they have a plug, they haven't really had any similarities. The uh, Nissan Leaf hits straight into the biggest segment in the Norwegian market, which is the VW Golf segment. Um, typically, you will find that Norwegians drive uh, a slightly different uh, setup of cars than you would probably find in Canada. Usually smaller cars or, um, or hatchbacks, um, which we use for hauling our entire family to the mountains. I'll get back to this in a moment. Um, Tesla has, uh, as you can probably tell from the graph, a fairly weird sales pattern. Uh, we count sales at the moment when the car is registered, i.e. when it gets a license plate. And since Tesla distributes cars by boat, we get a big boat of Teslas approximately every second month. So you'll see a quite varying pattern of Tesla deliveries in Norway. Um, as sort of a fun fact, uh, some guy, some journalist figured out that so far in 2014, I think 13% of every Tesla produced has found its way to, well, a fairly small area around the capital of Oslo. So if you go here, you're quite likely to be run over by a Tesla. Uh, by the way, please do come if you feel like it and do a little study trip. We'll be happy to accommodate you and find some way of making your trip interesting. Another interesting fact is that whereas electric cars sort of started to take off in and around the capital of Oslo, uh, the development now is that the growth is bigger everywhere else than Oslo. In 2008, uh, four out of five electric cars were, were sold in and around Oslo, but in 2014, so far, only two out of five cars are sold in and around Oslo. And this is important because this basically shows that this is not necessarily a strictly urban or a strictly big city phenomenon. Uh, sales are actually growing fastest in the most rural urban area, uh, sorry, rural non-urban areas you can imagine. And this is, although the volume out there is still fairly low, so it's very easy to get high growth numbers, it is still um, an interesting observation. Uh, and why is it like that? I'll try to get back to that in the moment. This is a list of Norwegian incentives. I won't go through this in detail. I'll leave it there for your future reference. What I'll do instead is to show you what this actually means. So let's look at it from a consumer point of view. Let's say you want to buy two, one out of two fairly similar cars. Let's say you want to compare the four-seater Mitsubishi iMu to a similar four-seater petrol car, say a Fiat 500. You could do the same thing with, uh, for instance, a Nissan Leaf or a VW Golf or an electric van or something like that. Uh, the general principle of what I'm about to show you still holds up. So don't 
look too hard at the numbers. Try instead to look at the concept. So let's say you're a consumer, you want to buy one of these two cars, you want to own it for about five years, and you want to drive approximately 15,000 kilometers per year. Which car should you buy? And let's for fun look at it from um, a Norwegian perspective, but includes our neighbors. And for you in Canada, I suppose the most interesting example here would be Sweden. Because Sweden is like most countries on the planet, it is a country without any sort of car taxation. So in Sweden, all cars pay VAT and that's it. In Norway, we have an import tax on petrol cars and diesel cars, which is calculated according to the car's weight, the car's engine, the size of the engine, the emissions from the car, which essentially means that a big heavy car with a lot of emissions will pay a hefty tax, whereas a small light car um, with low emissions will pay a very low tax. Uh, furthermore, electric vehicles are completely tax exempt. This means that an electric vehicle in Norway pays no VAT, no import tax. All right. First of all, depreciation. We believe that electric vehicles are going to depreciate like stones. Why do we believe this? Well, let's for fun say that we will actually succeed and that electric vehicles will become a mass market solution soon. If this is supposed to work, that means electric vehicles have to become significantly cheaper from the factory. We believe this to be very realistic. We see a quite large potential for large cost cutting in production of electric vehicles as volumes go up and as prices of especially batteries comes down. But if we then assume that we are actually going to make this work, if we assume that new electric cars are going to become significantly cheaper over the next five years, this means we should, by logic, depreciate existing electric vehicles quite hard in the second-hand market, because if similar electric vehicles become cheaper in the car um, dealership, that means the second-hand market will fall faster than for other similarly priced fossil fueled cars. So we've priced in a fairly disastrous second hand value in this. And we would rather that we be pleasantly surprised than be um, sorry that we were too optimistic. Maintenance. A lot of people claim that electric cars are cheap to maintain, which is partly true from our perspective, but not for the first three to five years. Uh, for the first three to five years, it's basically about uh, tires, suspension, brake pads, all the regular stuff. And this is basically the same for an electric vehicle as for a combustion engine vehicle. However, after three to five years, this is when you start having to change very expensive parts in your combustion engine vehicle, which you do not need to change in the electric vehicle. So after three to five years, we see a significant potential for uh, cheaper maintenance for electric cars but in this example we have not priced that in as it is a three to five year or actually a five year example fuel this is where it starts getting interesting uh, naturally this is fuel prices as they are over here I have no idea what fuel and electricity is priced uh, how that is priced in Canada but we have a calculator on our webpage. Uh, it is available in English. You can go there and input your own numbers and get these results um, as they would be in Canada. There is an annual registration fee, which is slightly lower for electric vehicles in Norway. So we've added in that. Cost of capital, i.e. the cost of actually financing the car. I'm not sure most private consumer would care about that, but we've included it anyways. So, in this, even if we are fairly conservative, the electric car comes out with a slight advantage. And this is, uh, actually these numbers are now a bit old. If I were to use the current prices, um, the numbers would be better in favor of the electric vehicle. So the problem here isn't really Norway, because the market has figured out that you can save a significant amount of money by going electric. And this is why you're also seeing fairly high numbers of sales outside of the cities, because if you live in the middle of nowhere, you would usually have two cars, and even though there are long distances, 
most of your driving is still in your local community, it is going to the shop, going with the kids to school, going to work, etc. And the range of today's electric vehicles are, for that purpose, good enough, even in the middle of nowhere. So the more you drive, the more you save, and this is one of the reasons why we are now seeing a large growth outside of the cities where driving distances are fairly long. However, in Sweden, who is going to cover the cost gap between the combustion engine vehicle and the electric vehicle? You cannot expect rational consumers to do that. And this is why, at least from our perspective, electric vehicle sales are fairly disastrous in all other markets. However, the good news is that once you get this into an equilibrium, once you get the electric vehicle to actually make economic sense, our experience tells us that if you just then wait a year, first of all, you have to actually make it work for real so that consumers can actually sit down and say, hey, we save money by going electric, this makes sense. Then you wait about a year, and this is when the girl on the left in the previous picture starts coming into play, because a few of these girls or a few of these consumers will then realize that this is a fairly good value proposition. They will go and buy the car. They will be very happy with the car. They will then tell their neighbor, their neighbor will go and try a car, etc. Um, I run a project called Green Car. It doesn't help if a guy from something called Green Car tells you that electric vehicles are great, because everyone knows I'm sort of paid to say that, which is true, I am. Uh, but when your neighbor comes over for dinner and says the same thing, that's when you start to see the ball actually rolling. So most people won't sit down and do this math. But most people will have some sort of notion on how this looks. And the current notion in Norway is that electric cars are really saving you money. So this impression has sort of been set in the marketplace. So if you're able to make do with the operational range of the electric car today, then you should probably change because you will save a lot of money. And by the way, as a curiosity, this little green area here is the cost of commuting from a suburb outside of Oslo and into Oslo just in road tolls for five years. Um, electric cars are exempt from road tolls uh, and this is one of the reasons why the electric car sales started out in the suburbs of Oslo but is now spread to other markets because earlier when cars were worse and more expensive than today these sort of uh, exemption for road toll and also the fact that you can ride in bus lanes made a bunch of commuters think that this was actually worth it. Today you're, not, you're no longer needing that road toll or that bus lane to justify the purchase in the same way as you did before. So this is why we are now seeing sales spreading to other areas. Okay, these are the numbers uh, if you care about them. About charging infrastructure, um, we have a few fast chargers, about 80 Tademo chargers. Uh, we have a bunch of very crude infrastructure, which works essentially household domestic plugs. Um, they're a bit of everywhere. Uh, there is a very, there isn't much of commercial infrastructure in Norway yet. We have the fast charging networks, but that's about it. This, to our experience, is the most important charging point of all. Uh, if you charge overnight, this means you can drive, do most of your daily driving uh, based on that charge. And from our experience, this is how the majority of Norwegian EV owners operate their cars. They charge overnight, if possible, and they have the opportunity, they charge during the day. But for most, this is not strictly necessary. Uh, some commuters depend on charging at work. This is also fairly easy to fix. But from our experience, you do not need an elaborate infrastructure to get people to buy electric cars. This is sort of um, an argument that we hear a lot from markets without electric cars. That you're saying, okay, we need a lot of infrastructure first and then people will buy cars because infrastructure is the problem. We politely disagree. We think that if you start targeting the customers, who have access to overnight charging at home, that's a good start. And if you then add charging, if you add fast chargers, if you add um, work charging, public infrastructure, etc., this will add to the market segments that you can reach. 
But if you have no one buying electric vehicles to begin with, then charging is not your problem. That means there is something else which is wrong, probably the whole pricing mechanism of the electric car, which is basically too expensive. Uh, and building chargers will get you precisely nowhere until you fix the underlying problem. But once you've fixed the underlying problem, which is then basically to make the electric car a good value proposition to a segment of the market, which already has charging sorted out, then you can build chargers and expand on the market segments. But we really do think that if this is a hand and egg problem, then really the hand comes first and the hand is the car. Um, so, yeah. Right. Um, this might actually be a point where Canada and Norway has something in common. Um, this is the population density of Europe. Um, please note the sort of white outlying area up to the left, which is about the same color as the slide background, which is Norway. We live in small dots around the coastline, and the middle of the country is essentially mountains, and no one lives there. But for some reason, um, we like to pack up our cars and go to this place in the middle of nowhere to something we call the cabin. This means that we have a transportation pattern and a carpool which is slightly different than a lot of other markets. Um, and this has some practical examples. This is the range of a Mitsubishi IMU on a nice summer's day. Um, the marker is centered on Oslo, so this is basically, the circle covers the area around Oslo where most of Norwegians actually live. Uh, we are five million people inside this circle. I think you'll find about 2.5 of those million. Um, however, this is what happens if you drop the outside temperature to minus six degrees Celsius. Uh, still no problem for everyday driving because most people still relate to whatever happens inside the circle. But what if you want to try to do long distance? So we tried that. We um, took our Nissan Leaf on a trip to a typical mountain resort, which is then 211 kilometers from Oslo. I'm very sorry, I'm not sure what that is in miles, but I'm sure someone can figure that out. Um, this was on a fairly normal winter day. It's minus 8 degrees Celsius outside. There is a highway on the stretch with a 100 km per hour speed limit. Uh, so we did what most people do. We just set the cruise control to 105 and set the cabin temperature to a toasty 20 degrees Celsius, which is, which is how you drive usually. Under these conditions, you get a few problems. First of all, fast charging isn't really fast when it's cold. Uh, this has to do with chemistry, so the battery quite simply will charge slower when it's not hot. Secondly, the energy consumption in the car increases as uh, the temperature drops, which I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with. So the result is that the driving pattern you get is something like this. If you start with a fully charged car, you can drive for perhaps 50 minutes. Then you charge for about one hour. Then you can drive 40 to 50 minutes charge for one hour, drive 40 to 50 minutes, etc. That's not really convenient. Um, but let's say a lot of people actually thought that was convenient and decided to use these kinds of cars to go to the cabin. So let's say you have 500 leaves departing between 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. on a Friday afternoon for this destination. What do you need to build to get all of these cars up there without unnecessary waiting time? Well, um, every car would need to charge approximately one and a half hours along the way. This means you need to build about 233 optimally placed Chademo chargers. Um, they will require five megawatts of installed effect, which is the equivalent of a small Norwegian town. Uh, and they will essentially be idle for most of the week because these cars will be then, or this infrastructure will then be scaled to meet peak demand. This isn't really a viable transportation pattern the way we see it. We don't think this is acceptable to customers. The infrastructure will be too expensive, so we don't really see this as a way to go forward. We see today's electric cars as absolutely brilliant for everyday use. It is technically possible to do long distance, but we don't see that transportation pattern as something we should encourage. So this is about how you market the car. Uh, electric cars is great for some things, but quite simply not brilliant for other things. 
So we are seeing that fast charging is important. It is important as a range extender for some days, but mostly it is important as a safety net. Most car users don't use their fast chargers that much. They will use them perhaps one, two, three times every now and then. That day when you've sort of gotten it wrong, you've gone to work, something happened, you needed to go somewhere, then you're supposed to pick up the kids, it's a bit colder than you thought, uh, charging failed, you need to go to soccer practice, and you quite simply don't have the juice to get there. So you boost your car on a fast charger while you do something else, and you're good to go. So that's sort of the charging pattern that we're seeing from these fast chargers. However, larger batteries change the scenario. Um, if you do the same scenario as previously, but with a Tesla Model S, from our perspective, you will then have about uh, 3 hours and 15 minutes of driving, then 45 minutes of fast charge, then about 2 hours, 2 hours and 15 minutes of driving, etc. That works, uh, but more importantly, most people will get to their cabin with their Tesla without having to stop at all, and then they can charge overnight in the slow comfort of their cabin. And this works. This is one of the reasons why you're seeing Tesla Model S being sold like warm bread in Norway. Um, both because this car is actually competitive in price with a completely different car segment than in other markets. This is due to Norwegian import tax on other cars. So typically a Tesla Model S in Norway will be comparable for a consumer to say a new VW Passat or a Ford Mondeo or something like that, which is fully specced. So when you can also then actually use this car in winter to get to the mountains, then you're starting to see why the Tesla is making a lot of sense in our marketplace. Um, as I mentioned, fast chargers are... Uh, not necessarily being used uh, to the full extent that we thought. Uh, we are collecting a lot of data from fast chargers in Norway. It is all on our webpage. And currently we're seeing a utilization rate of about 8% uh, on these chargers, which means two, two and a half hours per day. Um, we're also seeing that the cars in and around the population centers have a higher utilization rate whereas the chargers uh, outside of urban centers, typically corridor chargers, which is in the middle of nowhere on the way from A to B, are not being used that much. Um, if you look at the chargers on the way to a popular cabin destination, like the example I showed you earlier, the last charger on the chain, which is the one you need to get to your destination, but the charger which doesn't really have a local use uh, has a very, very low utilization rate, uh, perhaps one or two chargers per week. Um, we have seen that average charge time increases somewhat in winter. Essentially, we're seeing fast charging being used to fill up typically half your battery. So you charge perhaps 10 kilowatt hours. Uh, and the time it takes to get those 10 kilowatt hours is a bit longer in winter. So we are seeing a slight increase when it's colder outside, but not necessarily that significant, not as much as we thought, perhaps, to begin with. This might be because uh, people do other things when they charge. So they plug in their car, they go do something, they come back after 15 minutes, and they take off. And for a lot of people, the energy you get in those 15 minutes is more than enough, even in winter. But for others, the amount of energy they need is what sort of dictates the length of their stay. Um, but usually, our impression is that fast chargers are primarily used to boost your car occasionally and not to do long-distance travel. We have commercial operators on our charging points. Uh, they have different business models. Uh, in this chart, the blue uh, bars are a company called Fortum. They have a pay-per-minute model. The green bars is a company called Grand Contact, or Green Contact, if you will. They have a pay-per-charge model, and the um, orange bars are free chargers operated by ABB with no payment at all. And this is fast chargers, mind you. So we are seeing that the pay-per-minute model means customers stay shorter than otherwise, whereas the pay-per-charge model means customers are staying a bit longer. But uh, even if it's free, we're not seeing customers sort of 
overstaying because primarily if you're at a fast charger our impression is that you want to get out of there as soon as possible you're not there for fun you're there because you need some energy and then you go as soon as you have enough so we are still trying to figure out how these business models actually affect business and consumer behavior but so far the differences in charging times aren't really as great as we would think Norway's most used fast charger is naturally free. There are still a few free fast chargers, and it is outside a quite normal convenience store. This charger is in operations maybe 10 to 12 hours per day, so it's occupied 10 to 12 hours per day. And typically, this is what we pre previously uh, mentioned. It's you stop, plug in your car, go get some bananas and some milk, you come out and you drive. And in the time it takes you to shop, you've sort of just filled up your car with a little bit of juice you need to make sure you can do the evening's errands. Uh, however, once you introduce payments on free fast chargers, uh, a couple of interesting things happens. So the three curves here are three specific chargers uh, and the utilization rate for these chargers from June 2013 to January 2014. So the green and blue used to be free, but in late December uh, they were closed and payment was introduced. The red charger, which is in the vicinity of these two, has had payment all along. And so what we see is that when we closed off those two free chargers and introduced payment, the utilization for all three sank to the same level, about 8-9%. So... Um, our impression currently is that everything which is free is cool, but if you actually have to pay for it, then people don't really need fast chargers as much as they think. And they're certainly not willing to pay for it any more than what is strictly necessary. This creates a slight problem if you're supposed to make a business model for fast charging. And currently in Norway, there is a big gap between the commercial realities for uh, infrastructure developers and those trying to build upright charging points and the expectations of EV users. There seems to be a notion that uh, EV users think they're paying for essentially petrol. So they compare the price of a fast charge to the price of electricity and say that this is very expensive. Whereas the commercial reality for operators is that the price of a charge has absolutely nothing to do with the price of electricity. Um, the electricity is the least interesting cost component. It is much more relevant to look at the uh, total cost of installing and maintaining the charger, which is what's actually sort of um, the main business uh, cost you have. So we're still trying to learn. There's a lot of data on our webpage, and please feel free to check it out. So to sum up then, um, I have no idea if I've completely lost you during this or if you're still with me. Um, I'm sorry if it's been too long. Um, but to sum it up, uh, a few learning points from the Norwegian market. Um, electric vehicles are essentially just cars. Um, I have never met a single Norwegian who wants to buy e-mobility. It's basically just a car bought by regular people from regular dealerships for regular money and it's being used for regular things. So when it comes down to how you market it and how you sell it and how you package it with other products, at least in Norway, we don't want the revolution. We just want the car. Um, it is an absolutely brilliant car for some things, and it's a quite horrible car for other things. So make sure you target the people who can actually benefit from using it and keep it simple. Also, understate and over-deliver. Continuously, we see estimates of range which are completely unrelated to the real world. Um, it is much better to tell customers that the operational range of your electric car is perhaps 80 to 120 kilometers, depending on the weather and your right foot. Uh, and that's what you can actually do realistically with the car than to try to say that according to uh, a driving cycle, it's 190 kilometers. Uh, I have never ever encountered a Nissan Leaf which can do 190 kilometers under anything resembling normal conditions. So, 
we think is really important to be honest and not oversell the product because quite simply there is no reason to. The product is good enough in itself with its limitations for a large part of the market. So fast charging is necessary but not necessarily being used which is then slightly worrisome for the people trying to make money from it. So there is a business case for it, it's just hard to actually make it right. Um, these cars are bought by people using their own money. So whenever you communicate or whenever you try to make a business model, make sure it focuses on the user. Yes, uh, these cars might play a big role in reducing CO2 emissions, in saving or even uh, fixing fluctuations in the power grid, they might be great for reducing local pollutions, etc., etc. And these are important things to mention, but most people will not buy the car to save the planet. They will buy the car because they need a car. So when you're, con con when you're co communicating with the customer, make sure you focus on whatever the customer is caring about, which is probably what does it cost me, is it going to work, etc. Uh, and then afterwards, feel free to give him a good set of conscience with also the <laughs> underlining that you're now helping to reduce emissions, etc. But this is not the main selling point. It is sort of a good and fortunate side effect. We can also say that the customer satisfaction rate for electric vehicles in Norway is extremely high. And this is brand neutral. So whenever you talk to electric car owners, they're usually extremely happy with their cars, regardless of which electric car it is. And this is perhaps one of the most significant features of the Norwegian EV market because this is the foundation for their success. This is what drives the market forwards. The very simple fact that the people most efficiently selling electric vehicles are the current EV owners. So as long as they are happy, then the market will continue to roll forwards. Um, it's very hard to predict the future. Uh, if you were asked in the 1970s about the prospects of having a phone with a camera in it, I'm pretty sure that most of you would have absolutely no chance of guessing that. There are so many iterations you would need to go through in order to get there. Um, phones needed to be wireless, battery technology needed to improve so you could have a portable digital phone, camera technology needed to improve, and all this has to be packaged and priced in a way which makes it possible to put it all into a phone. So probably in the 1970s, you would have figured something like this, if you were asked. Um, this just illustrates how hard it is to look even 30 to 40 years into the future. And I don't think we are in any possession today to sort of corner the market and say, this is how it's going to be. So we need to be open in our approach, and we need to make sure that we keep our possibilities open. But nevertheless, we do believe that the future is electric. We do believe that it has started and is actually starting today. And with that, I thank you very much for your time. I'm sorry if this was too long. Feel free to contact me with any sort of questions you might have. Uh, and we wish you all the best of luck in your Canadian ventures to make sure that also the Canadian future is electric. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.